so it might surprise it might surprise you that we're actually entering into the season of Advent. I know it's like you know it's not even Thanksgiving yet, and we're already transitioning into thinking about Christmas. But that's actually how our church calendar is set up. It's actually very intentional. It's because Christmas is such an important season for Christians. So this week, what you've heard in the <clears throat> lesson readings that we read, the gospel reading, was actually a reading about John the Baptist. So I thought, what a fantastic thing for us to spend our time thinking about, is looking through the example of John the Baptist and understanding sort of the high-flying banner over his life, which is this line that you see up there, which says, he must, this is one of the words that John the Baptist says, he says, he must become greater and I must become less. So I want us to think about that and I want us to think about how does that become part of our story and our song for Christmas this year? How is that, like, I don't know what, how you guys, when you hear that, how you're even receiving it. Are you receiving it as something that's wonderful, something that's joyful, something that's worth celebrating? And that's what we're gonna tackle today. We're gonna go through the story of John, try to understand how John the Baptist comes to the point where he could say that line, he must become greater and I must become less. <clears throat> so let's take a moment now to pray. Father Almighty, we thank you for you are the God of the universe and you are greater than all of us here. And Father God, sometimes we stumble and think that this universe revolves around me. God, sometimes I think that you're there just to satisfy me. And sometimes this Christian world around us, especially here in the Bible Belt, it's so easy to believe that, God, you made everything for me to be happy. Yet your word keeps challenging us, God, again and again, that it's about you. The word, the scriptures, everything you've done is about you. So I ask you, God, today, as we spend our time before you in your word, learning about John the Baptist and his ministry, help us, Lord, to see that it is great news that it's about you. <clears throat> it is great joy for us, Lord, for us to enter into this invitation that you're giving us to be part of your work. It's great news if we would trust that this is about you. We pray that in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> So one of the key questions I wanted us to think about as I introdu introduced this sermon is the question, how do you read the scriptures and how do you think about the Christian faith? Do you think that it's about you? And I say that not like jokingly, but very seriously. In this day and age, a lot of people think that religion and Christianity specifically is about me. It's about how do I get a good, righteous life? I mean, you've seen the books and the titles, you've seen Christian bookstores full of thousands of self-help books on how to have the perfect life. If it isn't a purpose-driven life, it's like how to have your best life yet or whatever, a thousand titles. Not that those things are bad. You need to live a good Christian life. You need to live a good moral life. But I tell you, this is probably the biggest struggle of our day now is that we think that life is all about us. We think that God is all about us. God is this giant Santa Claus in heaven who we can just call upon him and he'll give you what you want. You just have to do the right, you know, you have to do the right things. You gotta pray the right prayers. You gotta come to church on Sunday. If you do all that, yeah, God will give you what you want. I tell you, no, that's not even Christianity. That's not even close. This faith is actually about that one God who is up there and so high and almighty but who come down, condescends to meet us where we are. But he doesn't want us to simply think about ourselves. He wants us to rejoice in who he is. And I tell you that that's actually really good news. Because if I were God, I tell you, I've tried to be God in my life for many, many years. I still struggle with this and I suck at it. I'm horrible at being God. I can't control like even my own family, my sons, you know, my two little boys, I can't even get them to obey and do what I want them to do, right? So think about that. And then I'm thinking about my own heart. I can't even control the thoughts in my mind. Sinful things that I don't wanna do, I do. 
sinful thoughts that I don't even want in my head, they're there. So I can't even be God over my life, let alone the like two and four year olds in my life. You know, there's no way that I can be God of this world. So it's actually good news when I tell you Christianity is not about you. It's about this God who condescended to meet you. So you might think that that's an unusual introduction, but I think that that really encapsulates everything that we're going to learn about John the Baptist's life. Because I want to show you how <clears throat> when you look at John's life, you see an example of somebody who had every reason to think that things should be about him. And yet, at that moment, when he's faced with what's going to happen with his ministry, we're going to hear that banner over his life. Those beautiful words that say, he must become greater and I must become lesser. And I want to help us move to the point where this is also the profession of your faith. So today, this is what we're going to do. Here's the quick outline. We're going to first talk about the greatness of John the Baptist. Then we're going to talk about his surprising humility and how he submits himself to the divine maker. And then lastly, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the invitation that God gives us into true joy. So let's start with who John the Baptist is. I'm sure all of you know John the Baptist. He's one of the most famous um, characters in the scriptures. He's that wild, crazy-haired guy who's out there in the wilderness. He's living like, you know, like, he's living out in the, in the wild, doing whatever he wants and in, in, in uh, you know, like a total madman. He's eating locusts and drinking honey and calling people to come out to the river and get baptized. I think a lot of us have a very strange picture of who John the Baptist was. I want to say that that's not really the true John the Baptist. John the Baptist is seen, as we start to read through him in the scriptures, we're going to see that who he is was a righteous man called by God to a divine ministry, which was to be the forerunner for Christ. He had one purpose in his life. The purpose was, hey, everybody, come here. Look, look, get ready. Jesus is coming. That was the whole point of his life to give that message to the world. Get ready, your God is coming. So he wasn't this wild and crazy guy that sometimes we think. Instead, he was a God-appointed person who, out of God's grace, had a very powerful ministry. So let's read <clears throat> a little bit in Luke, which we saw this, which um, Achen read before, but I want to highlight a couple of points from it. So this is Luke chapter 1, verses 11 to 17. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he, when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayers have been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice in his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. I want to pause there. So the two things that you're seeing already is that he is going to be somebody who brings gladness and joy and somebody who is going to be great before the Lord. This is prophetic words before this man is even conceived in his mother's womb. The prophetic words are, this guy is going to be great. He's not going to be an ordinary guy. He's not going to be stumbling around, not knowing what he's going to do in his life. He's going to be great before the Lord. And even more so, so amazing. I don't know if you guys caught this, but it says that he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. I want to step away from my notes for just one second now. And I want to just make a couple of tangential points here, just so you guys can, can see this. Sometimes we think that the scriptures are all about us, and it's about teach me how to do things left and right. You know, what do I need to do to have a good life? Teach me how to pray, how to, you know, come to church, all that type of stuff. I'll tell you that's all good and it's all there. That's not the point. But I want to point out as we go through a passage like this, something awesome. You want to ask a question about what does this church believe about abortion? Here's the answer right here. 
This is, a, this is a, before this child was even born, not just born, before John the Baptist was even conceived, I tell you, he was a believer because God declared that he would be a believer. You question, you know, can a child actually be baptized because they don't have faith? Ask that question right here. Here's somebody upon whom God declares the Holy Spirit filled them from the womb. Would you not let them into the Lord's table? So as you read through the scriptures, there is so much depth, so much meaning. It applies to every part of our lives. It's true, 100%. But I tell you, that's not even the reason why that's there. The point of this passage is about what John's life is going to do. <clears throat> so let's keep reading. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the father to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So here sums in these, in these two verses the full answer of what John the Baptist came to this world to do. The Lord appointed John for this one mission, which was to serve as a forerunner for Jesus Christ. He's standing here before you today as we prepare for Christmas. This message is saying to you, get ready, your Lord is coming. Get ready, Jesus Christ, the living God, is coming to this earth. Get ready. That's the message that God created John the Baptist to do. And it's an amazing, glorious thing that John had to do on this earth. So how great is John? Very few people have been given that privilege, that blessing, to be the one who goes before Christ. I mean, you and I actually have that blessing in a way, because as we preach the gospel, this is what we do. We prepare people's hearts for it. But John had a very unique ministry in Israel to proclaim Christ's coming and prepare a people repentant and ready for their, for their king. But I want, us, I want us to see a little bit further that John was a righteous man, he was a good man, and his ministry was really powerful, enough so that Jesus himself recognizes John. Now, let's switch quickly, switch gears, and look quickly at John chapter 3, verses 20 to, to 30. Or, actually, it's, sorry, it's John chapter 3, verses um, 7 through 11. This is what it says. <clears throat> As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowd concerning John. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes? Behold, those who wear soft clothes are in king's houses. What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, more than a prophet. This is he whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there have arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. So even Jesus recognizes the high place of John the Baptist. Jesus comes and says, look, you know the prophets, you honor them. They were fan you know, amazing people in the history of Israel. You know them, they were you know, amazing. Yet, I tell you, this man who you think is wild and crazy in the wilderness, he's actually even greater than them. And this man is, you know, his ministry is even more powerful than them. Quickly, we'll throw up a slide up there to show you, here's another way to summarize that picture. If you were to take all of the Old Testament prophets and just throw them up on a map, sort of giving them a, sort of a hierarchy based on how important, how big they are. You know, this is a rough picture. Don't like photograph it and say, oh, Manoj put the wrong person in the wrong place. And I don't know that God looks down from heaven and says, yeah, Moses was better than Elijah or something like that. I'm just throwing them up there. But here's the point of what Jesus says. Next slide. So John the Baptist would be the culmination of all of them. John the Baptist is the reason why all of these prophets even exist. So everything was pointing up to this prophet who's going to come, and his mission is going to be to tell us about Christ. 
When you think about the Old Testament, you think about the, the laws, the ceremonial rules that they had, the temple worship that they did, everything in the Old Testament pointing to one thing, which is to Christ. And John the Baptist, the culmination here, is doing that. He's making it so crystal clear. Repent, turn. No, don't turn to yourself. Turn to the one who's coming after me, who, who's, whose sandal I'm not even worthy to untie. Go to the one who's coming after me. I'm going to show you who he is. It's this guy named Jesus. You look at him, you think he's, you know, he's just a carpenter, has no like, honor or miracles or anything about him. Go to this guy. He's the one that the whole Old Testament pointed to. So when you come to John's ministry, you actually see that it's great. It's amazing. It's like the whole Old Testament. Every righteous deed, every good thing, everything is encompassed here. And you would think he would have a fantastic and powerful ministry. He actually did. Look, think about it. Here's a guy who, you know, he's out in the wilderness, walking along the Jordan River, calling people to come and partake in a, in a ritual cleansing act. And people actually took notice. Like, if you saw a crazy guy on the street saying, come, I'm going to wash you, I'm going to bathe you, you know, are, are you going to take notice of him? You're going to be like, I'm not going over there. Definitely not. Especially if you want me to take off my clothes, you're going to wash me? No way. I'm definitely not coming near you. But actually, with John's ministry, the Pharisees came. The Jewish high priests and leaders came to John. They recognized that this message that he had was something from God. They recognized that he was, in fact, a prophet. They were asking him, are you really a prophet? Like, you seem to be somebody coming from God with a message like the ones of the Old Testament telling us to repent. Are you really from God? I mean, we want to know if you're a prophet. Tell us. So even the leaders of Israel in their day came to see John. So he had, a, he had an important ministry. In fact, he had a very big ministry. There were crowds that were filling the Jordan River coming to see John. And then you might expect somebody like that. It's like, you know, he's like almost like, I don't know, like Joel Olstein or something or some other big preacher. He's got this big ministry, very powerful. Lots of people are coming to him. He should be pretty confident in his ministry, pretty happy. I would think he would want to do everything in his power to stop that ministry from falling apart. You would think he would want to find like want people to like rejoice in him and be like, you're a great guy, you know, you're pointing us to Christ, fantastic, I love you, and you know, we're gonna stay with you and be your disciples for the rest of your life. Yet the shocking thing that we see is as we move on to John, John chapter three, we start to see what happens to his ministry, and then we read John's response to what happens. So real quickly, before we read it, I want us to think about it this way. John is a cousin, a distant cousin of Jesus. And I think all of us understand like envy in, in our hearts. It's often most powerful when we meet people who are our family or people who are really close to us, or if nothing else, they look exactly like us. Look, you went to the same school as me, you work at the same company as me, you know, you got the same promotion at the same time as me. And then when that other person excels to the next level and I don't excel, I'm like, what? That's not fair. I don't get it. I did everything exactly the same as the other guy. Why am I not the one that's getting blessed? So the wicked heart of envy is actually enraged when it sees ones that are really similar to the other person exceeding that that's when your heart becomes the most pinged by envy. So as we think about John, this is a cousin of Jesus Christ. Prophetic words are spoken over his life. He knows he has a mission, divine mission from God. And people are stirred up thinking about who is this guy going to be? You can imagine from his very like baby days, people are saying, who's this guy, John? Look, when he was born, his father couldn't even speak a word until his name was pronounced. He's gonna do something great. He's going to be somebody of amazing, you know, amazing influence in this world. So you can imagine him now comparing himself to Jesus. Here's somebody who prophetic words are like not there. They're secret. We don't know those words. In fact, Jesus is born not to the daughter, son and daughter of a high priest. 
born out of, seemingly out of wedlock to, you know, a teenage pregnancy. That's what people are thinking. And here's this guy, Jesus, not doing any miracles when he's young, you know, just walking around like you and I, and, you know, John the Baptist is out there bringing in a huge ministry. I would think John's going to be asking some questions. Jesus, what have you done? I haven't seen you do any miracles yet. I haven't seen any great power in you yet. You could imagine that there must be some thoughts or tensions in his heart. I mean, maybe not. But if it was me, that's how I would feel. So now let's dig in and let's see what happens in John chapter 3. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out to the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John was also baptizing at Anon near Salem because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. An argument developed among some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, this man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he's baptizing and everybody is going to him. Do you guys feel the indignation there? These are John's disciples. They've been with John the Baptist for years. They've seen him create big crowds of people coming. They're getting washed. They're repenting. They're saying they're going to commit themselves to, you know, a new life. They're doing all of this great work. And now here's Jesus who's done nothing, relatively a nobody. We haven't seen any miracles out of him. We don't know anything about this Jesus. He's come in with a new band of disciples. Actually, he takes some of John the Baptist's disciples. He's coming in, and now he's doing the same thing as John. And he's baptizing people, and everybody is flocking to Jesus. You can imagine the indignation, if you can't hear it in the the voices of those disciples of John, you would think that John himself must be wondering, wait a minute, what's Jesus doing? Like, this is my ministry. You're stepping into, you know, my, my, you know, uh, ballpark here. You don't do that, do you? But yet, what we see is that John actually doesn't think about it like you and I. He doesn't think about it like the world. He thinks about it in in such a different way because he has the Spirit of God within him. This is what it says in in John 3, as we keep reading, 27 to 29. John's reply was this. He says, A person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. He must become greater. I must become less. So those are the words that I want to focus the rest of our time on. He must become greater. I must become less. What we see in John's response is first and foremost the submission to the divine. John knows his place here. John knows that his ministry is for a time and a purpose, and it was to point to Christ. And John knows that, look, it doesn't really matter how hard I stretch myself, how hard I work, what matters is what God gives me. What matters is what God has chosen to be mine. And those things that God has given to be mine, that's just such joy when God gives them. I don't have to worry about what's all around me and others have. What I do worry about is how do I continue to honor the things that God has given to me? So John the Baptist submits himself to that divine authority. And then he recognizes his place before Christ. He must become lesser and Christ must become greater. This is, so we're going to spend the rest of our time thinking about these teachings and thinking about the applications. But I want to just quickly summarize this, that What we're seeing here in John the Baptist is also summarized in the rest of the scriptures, but probably summarized in one of the best ways in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. This is what Paul says. He says, so whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. That's what John the Baptist was getting. That he could have made the ministry about himself. It could have been about, I'm going to save a thousand people by bringing them to Jordan River and washing and baptizing them. But he doesn't. 
he makes it about the glory of the one who really mattered, it's Christ. So when you think about the scriptures and you think about your life, what are you setting up? Are you setting up a life of, look, I wanna look great, I want people to applaud me, I wanna have a life that's exciting and full and happy, and I need God to be that genie where I ask him, God, give me what I want, and he fills it up? Or are we setting up a life where everything I do, I work as hard as I can, I spend my life out for it, but it's for his glory. It doesn't matter if he takes it away. It doesn't matter if he increases it, makes it grow, or if he makes it smaller. I'm doing it for his glory. And when it's for his glory, I'm going to show you that it's actually going to be joy. So let's talk about a couple of applications as we pause here. <clears throat> so the first application I want to draw from this point is the question of how do we lead within a church? Now, when I say that, I don't want any of you in this church to think that this only applies to those people who have sort of some visible positions of leadership. I'll explain what I mean here. When I say we're going to talk about the first fear is how do you lead in the church? I mean, you know, this applies clearly to Achens. It applies to those like me who preach in this church. It applies to anybody who teaches in Sunday school or is teaching in like youth groups or, or small groups or whatever we do. It applies to us who are even, you know, doing outreach ministries, worship team, whatever way that you're leading in this church, even if it's an administrative role, this applies to you. But the question here, like John the Baptist, how do you lead? Are you leading with the mindset that my ministry must grow and I must have more increase and everyone must applaud me and I can't let it go? Or are you leading with a mindset of Christ? I want Christ to be seen. You look at me, I don't want you to see Manoj up here. I want you to see Jesus. I don't want you to see, you know, I don't want you to see um, Sheba up here when we're worshiping. I, Sheba wants you to see Christ. Is that the way that we approach it? Do you guys think about that before you step into this room, into this church, before you participate in, you know, life groups, whatever it is? Is that our mindset? First and foremost, if it's not about Christ, then it's going to be about me. So let's not make it about me. First thing I do is I pray and ask God, God, make this about you. Take me out of this picture and let you come through. <clears throat> But don't assume that this is only for those who have visible positions in the church. Surely those who have visible positions in the church, this is actually far more like poignant and far more important, but this is actually for everybody. I'll tell you for me, like personal experience, ever since I was young, I know this about myself. I like to have people applaud me. I like to be made much of. I like to you know, stand in a position of being a leader and have everyone follow me. That's something that I would like to do. So early on in my Christian faith, since the beginning, I've always stepped away from those places. I've always said, I'm not gonna take those roles. I'm not gonna go down that path unless the Lord really leads me. So the first thing that I do when like I feel tugging my heart, hey, oh, I'd love to step up and become the, you know, the leader of, a, like, you know, in college I was leaders at InterVarsity. I want to step up and be a leader. First thing I said was, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to sit and I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask the Lord. And then when it's like door after door, people are knocking them down, telling me, you need to take this role. There's no one else. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. No one else can do it. No one, you know, we've prayed about it. You're the one. Then I'm like, okay, Lord, I'll do it. I didn't really want to do it, but I will do it. I would love to see that in our, as part of our mindset in this church. Not that I don't want you guys to serve. Not that I want people to say, I'm not going to serve because, you know, I think I'm going to stumble in this way. But I want you to think that way first. That, look, I don't want to be the center of attention here. I want Christ to be the center. And sometimes I get in the way. So if that's going to happen, then Lord, keep my mouth shut. Keep me out of this arena. And let your will, let your words be spoken through others, for they're able to do it. Look, sometimes I think we struggle with this. We think that we're so important. You know, God can't do his cosmic work in this universe without Manoj. I tell you, it doesn't matter if I was here or not. 
You know, if, God, if Jesus would say that, that the rocks would cry out and testify, if people don't, though, he can certainly work without me. <clears throat> so that's the mindset that we have to have. It's all about Christ's glory. So this first, first sphere is within the church. It's how we lead. Then there's a second sphere for how we, how we think about this, and that's how do you conduct yourself outside of church? Do you conduct yourself in such a way that you reflect the same mindset that, you know, life is not about you? That there are bigger things here for us to do than to be all about, you know, all about me. I'll give you a quick example of this, something that I've been recently learning. So there have been various people that I've managed in my life in different spheres of, of work. And I have, I will confess, I have not done a very good job of managing them in the past. Because oftentimes what I would see is, I would see these young people that I worked with as sort of a threat to me. If they succeed, they come up with great ideas, you know, they do fantastic accomplishments, I kind of wanted to take some of the credit for it. I kind of wanted to say, hey, you know, well, you know, that's, that was because I gave them the idea. I mean, I helped them do it. I was part of it here or there. And so uh, whenever we had conversations, I would throw in my little bit of, oh yeah, I helped in this part, don't forget that, right? Don't forget that, I was in this, involved in here. So recently what I've been learning is that there's a better way for me to manage my team. <clears throat> and the better way is for me to actually recognize the good work that the people in my group are doing and to just honor that. In fact, what I found myself doing is now going to bat for the people that are on my team. When, when leaders don't recognize the work that they did, I, I pipe up, I raise my hand, I say, I want you to see the, the great work that they did. I want to walk through the work that they accomplished, not for my sake, but because they did a great job and they deserve that recognition. It's a totally different mindset to go at your world thinking about what can I get, what can I get, what credit can I get, how can I make people recognize me, to going about your world thinking about how do I share that <clears throat> grace that God has given me? How do I share that love that God has poured out on me? God's given to me success in a measure. I want others who work with me to experience that same success. So that's the second sphere. How do we think about our lives as Christians in a fallen world as one that's offering grace to the world and showing that it's not about me, it's still about Christ, which means I can love my neighbors. I can love those around me. So those are the two applications. <clears throat> how do we lead in the church and how do we lead in our, in our own lives outside of the church? Now let's turn to probably, I'd say, the most important thing for us to see here in John the Baptist's story. Turn quickly with me back to John chapter 3, verse 29. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. <clears throat> the thing that amazes me about John the Baptist is that he doesn't go about submission by servile obedience. What I mean by that is he doesn't go about submitting to God's will simply by discipline or force of habit or some begrudging sense of, I've got to do this. He isn't going after obeying God's will, saying, if I do it, God's going to give me something good. He's not doing it in any of these ways. He's doing it in a totally different, with a totally different mindset, totally different attitude. His mindset is, this is actually beautiful. This is actually joy for me. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy. That joy is mine and is now complete. To understand this, let's just step back and think about the illustration that John the Baptist is using here. He's talking about being the bride, be, being like sort of like the best man or a groomsman in, in a wedding party, being there with, um, you know, with the bridegroom and sharing in the excitement. 
So I'll share with you quickly, you know, I don't know if, if many of you have had the chance to be bridesmaids or, or groomsmen. I was, the, um, I was the best man at my brother's wedding. And it was a very, like, it was a really a wonderful experience. But this is what I want to share from it. There was a lot of work being the best man. It was work from both planning the wedding to, you know, participating in it, getting dressed up, shaving, looking nice, doing a lot of stuff that, you know, you don't do in an ordinary day. You know, you look your best, you, you get up there, you're standing in front of the church. You have the opportunity to give like one of the most important speeches in the, during the reception, right? So it feels like, hey, that's an important role. It was an important day for me. But remember, that day wasn't about the best man. The day was about the bride and the groom. It was about my brother and his wife. And I tell you, when I went through that experience, there was so much joy in watching my brother getting married because what I started to see and experience, it had nothing to do with like the work or me being up there or whatever. It was the fact that God actually answered these prayers to do something that I, even in my own heart, felt was impossible. I got my brother married. I mean, he's a great guy, but I wondered like, Lord, who are you going to find for him? He's, you know, he's got so many interesting quirks, such a personality. Who are you going to find for him? I love him, but I'm just saying, right? So, you know, just to see that and then to see the beautiful person that God brought in his life and to see the joy that came in his heart when she came and now to watch, uh, I think more than 10 years later, after they've been married, how much transformation God has done in his life. I tell you, there is so much joy in, in being part of that wedding. And that's what he's talking about. The experience of joy when I didn't have really anything to do with it because it wasn't about me. But I worked my hardest. I did my part there. And now God takes over and I get to watch God do something amazing. And that gives you great joy. So that's the illustration that, that, uh, that John the Baptist is using here. I want to also illustrate that in one other way. So when I, was in, when I was in graduate school, one of the things that I did, and this also was very begrudgingly, I decided to start a Bible study theology group at my college campus. And I did it with a lot of qualms in my own heart asking, look, I'm not seminary trained. I'm not ready to teach anything. I don't have anything really good to offer. I don't even have time to do it. Lord, why would I do this? Yet, for whatever reason, the Lord had chosen me. And I heard it through the friends who kept saying, you know, you should do this. We should get this together. There's a need here. Nobody's stepping into the void. Manoj, why don't you do it? And in the end, I stepped in and I participated and started this Bible study group and started figuring out what are we going to teach? What are we going to, you know, learn about? And then spending my days with, um, it was a group of, with six guys, six to eight different guys who would come, guys and girls who would come. And it was an amazing time. For four years, it was an amazing experience for me of growing. And it was a fantastic, I think, experience for everybody who was part of that group of just growing in the Lord. Now, come the time that I graduate and I'm ready to move on from from graduate school and I actually have a job out in Boston and I have to leave this whole crew behind. I tell you, it was heartbreaking so hard to make the decision to leave. <clears throat> and the reason why it was hard was because I love these guys, but also because this was my ministry. This was the thing that I did. I didn't want to lose that, that place, that ministry that I was part of. I didn't want to like give up on you know, maybe some of it was like the applause or the joy of, you know, hearing the praises of people, whatever it was. I didn't want to give up on it. But the Lord moved me away. And the amazing thing I want to tell you guys about is how much more joy I had in giving up that ministry than if I had kept it. Because what happened after that is that those guys moved on to different places. They went to other cities. They went to different churches. One of them is starting, you know, is, is at a Korean church in DC. He's sort of a youth chap, youth, sort of a youth chaplain over, over the kids there. Another one is a deacon at, a, at, a, at another church. They've all gone on to do great things. Like we spent those years together. We learned together. I had a part in it, in that ministry. But when I let go of the ministry, that's when I got to see God work. That's when I got to see 
God doing a mighty work in, the, in everybody, <clears throat> in each one of their lives. And it's so much more of a blessing to me. As we fellowship, we call each other, we talk about these things, we see the, the wonder and joy of what God does. So if we hold on to it, what happens is it doesn't grow. But when we let go of it, we see that God does what we never thought was possible. God starts to work, and he does so much more. So those are, I think, the keys to finding joy here in, in letting Christ become greater and I become lesser. So the last application I want to draw for you, and this is based on, based on the studies, actually, that we've been doing in the book of James. We've been listening to Matt Chandler. It's been an awesome experience in men's life group. And one of the things that Chandler mentioned that really struck a chord with me was he asked this question. He said, how do you read the Bible? And he said, do you read it like me, like you're going out on a date? And I thought that was really strange. What does that mean? Like, read the Bible like you're on a date? But he had a really good point. What he meant was, when you go to the Bible, are you looking at it for facts and numbers and pieces of history and thinking about it like maybe it's a newspaper article or an encyclopedia? Are you looking for rules like how to live my life and how to get a better life here? Or are you going after the Bible like it's a book that shows you the beauty of your God? Are you going there looking for God's greatness? Are you going there looking for his glory? Are you going to the scriptures looking for his tenderness and gentleness, his love, his faithfulness? Are you going there looking for the sacrifice that he made for you to testify that he loves you? So if you read the scriptures the latter way, <clears throat> if you read it for, here's what I need to do, here's how I need to live, you're going to find that your Christian faith is going to be servile obedience and grudging obedience. It's a, I don't really want to do it, but I'm going to do it to get to an end. But if you read it this other way, which is the way of looking for the beauty of God, you're going to find that you're enthralled by him. You're going to find that you want to serve him, that it's not about, you know, my kingdom. It's about Christ's kingdom. And when he gets bigger and he is made known the way he truly is, then I'm happy. I'm excited because I love to see God's glory. So that's what, I, that's what I want to see for us. And as you guys prepare for Christmas, this is what I want us to think about. Christmas is actually all about Christ is getting bigger and I am getting smaller. So let's go together, you know, trusting that, <clears throat> that God is able to change our hearts and help us to see, you know, that we're really not that important. He is absolutely important, but when I trust that, I actually find that it's great joy. So let's pray. Father Almighty, you are the biggest God of the universe, and we can't even fathom how great and glorious and good you are. And I thank you, God, that in every way you show us each day that it's not about us, it's about you, it's about your son. I thank you, God, that this is good news for us because we can't be God over this world, but you surely are. And I thank you, God, that you surely love us. You love us so much that you won't leave us in this place of sin, but you cause us to see how good, how glorious you are, and you give us not servile, begrudging obedience. You give us glad-hearted submission, glad-hearted submission to your will. So I ask you, Lord, <clears throat> this week as we labor in church, as we labor in the world, help us to do these, help us to live as those who have been touched by your grace, who know that you are God over all things and over all, all of us, and that it is for your glory that we work not for our renown. So we ask you, Lord, help us and bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.